much for coming today. It's such an honor to be here um, and to get to talk about my art feels like a natural um, event and just to have this opportunity. I think so thank you to Barbara too. It's, it's very sweet of her to consider me. Um, so I I would say that I um, my parents would tell you that from the time I was two, I carried around um, Dr. Spock's child rearing book with a pencil and would draw little marks in it all the time. Um, so, but for me, my memory of doing art, I mean, I would say six or seven years old, I remember um, feeling um, that it was something that I was getting positive feedback for doing. Um, and I remember entering a coloring contest, which seems funny now, but I was so proud that I won $5 for <laughs> a coloring contest at Albertsons. <laughs> so I would say that it's not a matter of something that I just did, it's who I am. Um, it just was always what I did. And um, at certain parts of my life, I've done it more than others, but um, I just feel like it's part of who I am. And, uh, and you, I'm um, just going to ask you, you studied art along with history. Mm -hmm. How wonderful, what a great combination. And I imagine art history was part of your study of history, and you evolved into then majoring in art. Yes. Well, so yeah. I, I studied I studied art more as, um, it, I studied history because I love stories and, um, and I liked social history. So um, history for me was more about people and the stories that surrounded those people. And um, I went to school in the Northwest um, and Halfway through college, I transferred to the University of Puget Sound from the University of Portland. And at that time, I discovered um, studying art as would be a bachelor's degree in art. So I tried as hard as I could to get as many art classes in at that point as I could. But I was already so far into my history major that, and I was on scholarship for playing soccer. So um, per my parents' request, just get your history degree and let's go to the next step. And continue to play soccer, huh? Yeah. 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 Uh, tell yeah. us about that. Tell us about a moment about soccer and how that was a challenge as you were traveling a lot. Yeah. Ah, along with the study. Yes. Well, especially at Puget Sound because I studied printmaking. Is anyone a printmaker in here? So it's so hard. Printmaking is, it's, I, I love printmaking, I love the process of printmaking, but because I did um, lithography and etching, we did, we did a whole sample, but the one that I was most drawn to was lithography and we work on the stone. And so, talk about trying to juggle that with a heavy soccer schedule, it's hard because um, every step of that process of preparing your stone is so important to the final outcome that you can't shortchange it. And if you're running short on time, then your end piece is going to show that. <laughs> that. Three weeks ago, you didn't have a lot of time to level your stone, did you? Because everything's not, it's not printing. <laughs> and you try to tell your coach that. You know, yeah. You were being <laughs> well, how wonderful that you stayed with both. You did it. And I then you met your husband. Yes. He's over there in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. Stand up, sir. What's your name? Wayne. Wayne, welcome. So delighted to have you here. Yes. Yeah, you met in a, in a restaurant. Both work at, working in the same restaurant. Yes, so after college, I moved uh, back down to Portland to live with my best girlfriend. And um, I started working at a restaurant called Mozzie's Italian Restaurant, and that's where I met Dwayne. And ironically, we're both from Colorado, so we had an instant connection, and then we shortly thereafter got engaged with that. So. And then, uh, with 
when you're having, what, Wendy's with Dave Thomas? Is that how you got here? Yes. Hey, so, Dave Thomas yeah. is one of my favorite people. He's <laughs> good people. Oh. There's a lot of good people at Wendy's that came over. You want, you want to stand up here and tell sure, us? Sure. I just, we moved for Wendy's an opportunity that we also, partly because we wanted to, it was going to supply Amy more time to really study in her uh -huh. practice of art, and that was part of our goal. So, because we've always kind of had a joint venture. But yeah, we went to Wendy's, it was great. There's a lot of great people there. We actually met tomorrow with David Karen, who was the CEO at Wendy's. So, he's uh, a good standing guy, but he's committed for sure. So, yeah, that's it. That's really it. Oh, we got here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, well, I was sharing with Amy that um, I was at Franklin University graduation doing the invocation and benediction, and our main speaker was Dave Thomas. So we sat together, and while the, all the students were ran this, you know, yeah, there's all, so we had this little conversation, and I said, um, Dave, how beautiful you're adopted. He broke out into this incredible conversation that I will never forget because we've adopted our two children. And I shared that story, and as you said, it was a great experience working for Wendy's because that's who he was. He was a caring person, and it came from his roots, you said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we, um, it was hard to leave Colorado because our family is all there. And uh, I have three children, 7, 13, and 16 almost. So to take them from the grandparents was really a hard choice. And it's hard on the grandparents. It's hard on Dwayne and I because we're often trying to balance everything, just the two of us. Um, but Dwayne and I both felt like for his career, this was a great opportunity. And then it afforded me the opportunity to not work and to paint. So it was kind of a, a joint, it was a joint opportunity, really. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, tell us now about your painting, as we're surrounded by this beauty. Okay. Well, um, I, I um, most importantly in my work, I am drawn to things that I would consider to be organic. Um, I, I, enjoy animals and figures because I like to study form and um, so when we when we lived in Colorado I studied at the Art Students League of Denver and I studied under a lady named Michelle Torres who is a nationally known figure artist and someone who I have endless uh, respect and gratitude for what she taught me in the two and a half years that I studied with her. It shaped who I am as an artist. Quite frankly, my process and everything and how I think about art is inspired through her. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I moved here, I didn't have access to a figure or a model because I was not connected in this community. And I was pregnant with my son Jack and I and I I just didn't know how to get plugged in. It took a long time. Some of that's my life stage, and some of that's just not knowing Columbus. Um, and I think about it now, I think, oh, it would have been so easy. <laughs> you know, just come here. But I didn't know. I just didn't know. So, um, so studying the figure with Michelle Torres was a valuable part of my development. But when I came here, I didn't have access, so I started doing chickens. And, um, which seems funny, like chickens and humans are different, but it's still that study of form and shape and organic line that I am drawn to. And same thing with like um, sheep and cows and all of the farm animals that we have access to here that I could find just by driving to Stratford Farms or, you know, Slate Run Farms full of animals. And I could go there and I could see them and I could sketch them and then I could take that back home and I could work on it in my studio. So that's where my love of working with chickens and ducks. Well, why don't you tell us a little about these chickens and that rooster? You can go right oh, okay. the painting. Yeah. Um, well, so this is 
actually, these, all of the work up here is recent work that I've done. Um, I, my daughter, she's uh, going to be 16, I think I shared with you, she's at Westerville North High School. And her teacher of uh, biology has a farm over near Granville, and these are her chickens. So she, she granted me permission to come and spend time with her. So this is Goliath. And these are his girls. And he's got about 20 girls, actually. That's <laughs> quite the guy about town. But um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, but for me, so how do you go about the life of the girls? How do you do this? How does it come about? Well, yeah. so for this particular painting, um, I start with direct observation. So I have to experience the subject personally, and, and the light is very important to me. In most of my paintings, you'll notice that there's a strong light source, yes. which creates a cast shadow, and a light and dark side to all of the shapes. So I would, this is not something I made up, this is something I learned, was that I would consider myself a light and shadow painter, and that I seek to paint things that are, and my subjects, I design my paintings to have light and dark. So if you were to squint at this, you can see a definitive line between where the light and the shadow meet. Mm -hmm. And um, what's interesting for me is where they meet and how that transitions. So when I set this painting up in particular, I always set up all my paintings, I try to do a thumbnail sketch. And actually I have this one. Um, so for this particular painting, oh, I did um, these sketches here, which you guys can just look at. It's fun. Um, and the idea was is I'm, I'm mapping out what would be called a dark light pattern. So deciding what's in the light and what's in the dark. And that drives everything in my composition. So when I'm looking at my subjects, I have to make decisions sometimes, because sometimes it's not so easy to tell. But if you do these little sketches, then you can kind of work through it. And then when you go and you lay it onto the canvas, you've already got a map of what you're doing. So for me, so then I'll go in with a light wash of um, transparent uh, alizarin and sap green. And I will do a gesture drawing to get my shapes in. And then I will block in what's light and what's dark. And that's the basis for my other painting. And then I go ahead and then I start mixing my colors. And I block in larger colors. So for this particular painting, I, I definitely made a choice to make this all dark because of the composition. Because I thought that was more interesting than what it really was in life. It wasn't like that. But when I was constructing this, I thought, well, that's just more interesting that way. And I get to decide. <laughs> I'm the decider, so it's fine. I can do whatever I want, as long as it still holds together compositionally. Um, and so then I go and I get all my darks in, and then I lay in one um, large section of my lights. And then I start manipulating the dark space. So in this particular painting, if you look at it, most of the information about what's going on in this image is most of the story is told in the dark parts. In other words, I have fewer value ranges in the lighter shapes than I do in my darker shapes. More, more, I spend more time building up the dark than I did the light in this particular piece. So that way, and same with this one of my daughter that I just recently painted. The light shapes, really, there's only like maybe two or three ranges of value in here. Most of the information is here in the dark. So that's something I consciously am trying now. It's hard. I don't always do a very good job of it. But I'm trying to think about those more, more design elements when I'm painting and how that affects my composition and the overall structure. Do you um, take photographs so that you have a, a sense of the colors, or did you make the colors up as you went along? I, I take photographs, 
that I don't paint from photographs. Right. I paint from my iPad. And for me, the difference is um, the photograph will flatten everything out. But if you paint from an iPad or a screen, mm -hmm. it's probably closer to from life because of the light source okay. from behind. You know what I'm saying? It's different. It doesn't. It's not as flat as when it's printed on. Paper. But but at least with the photograph, it gives you a sense of this is the color that I saw three days ago. Yes. Yes. And sometimes you have, and that's one thing I've learned over time is to trust myself and say I think like for example in these pumpkins, I said I think there's blue in there. It's not maybe showing up in this image, but I'm going to throw it in there because it works. Mm -hmm. And it contrasts the mm -hmm. orange, so I'm just going to put it in there because I know that won't work. But to your point, I definitely, I definitely try to be representational mm -hmm. in my work. I'm not, I don't, I'm not abstracting, although I think about it abstractly, and I definitely um, hope to have it be recognizable to the viewer. You said you paint from your iPad. Are, are you taking a photo with the iPad, or are you putting the image, the photo you took? How, how are you getting the image on the iPad? I don't know much about it, obviously. Well, most, um, I, I usually, you can take a picture with mm -hmm. your iPad. Yes. Um, I take it with my phone or with a camera, right. and I transfer it onto my okay. hard drive, and then yeah. upload it to my iCloud. Sure. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, any more like the phones, the iPhone, the mm -hmm. new iPhone, that pictures are phenomenal yes. that I've seen. So I think that you can do that. Like, you, know, you could probably paint from your phone if the screen is big enough. The phone might be even different than a flat phone. Because I know photography flattens the image, and it also changes the color. But yes. you must remember the colors that you've seen because of how long you've been doing this, or you yeah. see colors. I think so. And I, what I think is more important, too, is that you know your palette. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you know your palette, then then you can get color harmony, mm -hmm. even if the color isn't exactly what it was in life. Sure. So um, that, to me, is more important. But Do you use, what is your palette? Do you use the same? I used to, like, throw different stuff on there, mm -hmm. and I learned for myself, I've stuck with the same palette the last two years, the colors, and it's um, it's been so good for my work because I, I know what I can do with these colors now. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the next evolution will be to add more color or to take some stuff out. Mm -hmm. and, and that will be interesting to see what that does with my paintings. Because if you look, there is a common, and they all, they all look very similar in color. So, but to, um, to change that is going to be interesting. So I have, um, I usually do a warm and cool in each color. So I recently, I added lemon yellow back to my palette. Mm -hmm. um, but I have cad yellow, medium, or cad yellow, I have um, cad red light, which, or cad red light, yes, and then I have cadmium orange, and I have, um, I'm trying to think sequentially of how I put it on there. So then I put on um, alizarin, crimson, and sometimes I use um, cobalt blue. Sometimes I use cerulean blue. Depends on which, if I'm working with something that has more green blue, then I'll put cerulean down. But normally I use, I always use French ultramarine blue mm -hmm. and cobalt. And then cerulean's typically on there too, and then sap green, and then recently I added viridian and phthalo back in, depending on what I was painting. But phthalo green is very strong, as mm -hmm. many of you probably know, it's like dangerous. <laughs> strong. Would that be in anything you have here? Um, the um, viridian, I don't know that I use viridian in any of these paintings here. Um, Yes, not here. Um, I have some cows at the studio that have a little gray look there. But and then uh, and then I use Permalba white. It's called Permalba. It's a brand, mm -hmm. and it's really um, the the Scotsy is very much like um, butter. Like it's not really. You know how some whites are real thick and 
This it's it's much softer, much softer. Is there a certain yeah. It's called Permalva White. All brands make it. Yeah, yeah, it's just Permalva the brand, and so they it's white and you can get black too. That's all we make. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you start using it? Well, or have you always used I've it? always used it. Okay. I mean, that's where I'm probably stuck in our rut. Like, I've <laughs> always only used that because um, when I was in Denver, I studied uh, for a while with a lady named Betty Curran, mm -hmm. who had a studio right after Glenn and I got married. And um, she, she gave it, we did a Secret Santa in mm -hmm. the studio. And I and we did that, you know, exchange thing, and I got that. Wow. Uh, and then it's what she used. <laughs> so and now I just I wouldn't use anything else because I know how how it works. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's so interesting because even white. I mean, there's so many different yes, lights. There are. It's overwhelming. So for me, I'm like right now. I'm like for me to add a little bit of like Indian yellow to my palette feels very like on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit on the edge. I added meridian and phthalo. That's crazy. So. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, would you like to show us what you have here? On your oh, sure. Well, so your, your genius uh, move for the top <laughs> and uh, yeah. putting together this um, lovely show. Yeah. So, okay. So, I have a fondness for ducks. I really love white ducks. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a painting I completed uh, right when we moved into our studios. So my uh, studio partner, Lisa Godfrey, is right there with her phone taking pictures for me. But she and I and another lady named Karen LaValle um, are renting studio space at 24 Lincoln in um, association with the Sharon Weiss Gallery. And um, so we moved in in January and it's been a phenomenal time for me, the, and I think Lisa would agree, like the last four months we have uh, been painting like crazy um, and having so much fun. And so this is one of the first pieces I completed in the studio. Um, but so I just love ducks. I just, something about them, I mean to get very little. Um, and I've done a lot of ducks actually. Um, I think it beckons back to my childhood, to be honest. Um, like, I think of Peter Rabbit. <laughs> I, I know this sounds very no. um, silly, but I honestly think sometimes when I'm painting that they, they're talking to each other. Like, it just feels like they're, they have personality <coughs> beyond. Um, so, let's see here. They strut. They do, and they, they're, they're together. Um, Without necessarily referring to something. I Obviously. think um, 
I think that one thing that I learned is that, yes, there is a lot of design that has to go into it beforehand, but um, a lot of these just take a ton of pictures. Because yeah. you'll, if you, the more, like, it's easier now because we all have automatic phones, cameras, and stuff, so we can just do tons of pictures. Because within those, if you start flipping through your pictures, you're going to see compositions. Whereas before, maybe even 15 years ago, it was like, oh, I don't know if this picture is going to turn out. Like, it just wasn't the same. You didn't have the same freedoms. But even but, then, you, you could have the shadows from one to the other. It'll change depending on how they're placed, and that wouldn't be in the picture. You'd have to yeah, create them. Yeah, you do, them, you right? do have to take artistic license yeah. and make a choice about what to leave in, what, what I ask myself is, is this part of the story that I'm trying to tell, or is it distracting? If it, if it doesn't make sense, we'll just change it. This is just, it's just what you feel from from where you've been and what you feel about the animals and yeah. the colors that present themselves. Because from, like, I like how you've done the grass and stuff, but it's not, it's your colors <laughs> that you use oh, in yeah. a different way. It's not like... It's not like you said. It's organic. It's right. it's it's not exactly what it is when you've seen it, but it works. It's very effective. Well, and you know, thank you for saying that because one, you want to use, yeah. one thing that I um, early on when I when I first started painting with oils, I was really um, and even now I find myself sometimes saying. It doesn't look like a thing. Do you know what I mean by that? Like you're painting something and you're trying to do it representationally and you say it doesn't actually look like what it's supposed to be. And then I pause and I say, but you could take a picture of the thing. And what makes it about my work and what makes it valuable to give back to other people to look at is that I make it the way I want it to look and I express it in my way. So it's, it's good that everyone recognizes this as grass, because that's what it is, but it's not really grass, it's paint. <laughs> but, it, but it's done in a way where it's not like, like the grass out there right now is really super green. But right there, you can see yellows and different shades of green in there, so it's not like, it's just, yeah, it, it's just smooth. It just yeah. runs very smoothly and blends in with with all the whites and you've got a little bit of yellow in there and blue. It's just nice. Thank you. But it's not the focal point. It doesn't really track. Does. No. Right. It's not heavy. I am. Um, I definitely, um, if I'm being totally honest, most of the, most of my, um, Mostly when I get into my grass areas, I'm at that point at the end of my painting process, and honestly, I start getting very loose. And I'm tighter in my rendering of the objects themselves, but then when I get to the, the background and the foreground and the grass and the water or whatever it is, I find myself loosening up, and I wish I could tap into that earlier. Honestly, but I don't know how to channel that yet. I'm still working towards that. So you actually start with the, the main subject.